based on a true story. Nika, you narrate. Okay. Her red-rimmed eyes watched him walk away. Her shivering hands unfolded at the chisel from their hiding place in her dress. Her white lips drew back from her teeth that were strong, yet crooked from the front and stained a light yellow from the tobacco. She preferred the day of her father's tin. Father had told her never to give up. Never to let anyone treat her like dirt. Never to take no for an answer. She gripped the chisel tightly in her hands and took a trembling step towards the path. The glint of the chisel blade served to calm her, to light her away. She took another step forward, this one more steady, more ready than the first. Better to have loved and lost to never have loved at all. Wait, I don't think the character's voice in this line, so Kelly, go ahead. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Better to have loved and lost than to never have loved at all. <laughs> she teach this man, this so-called lover, the true meaning of love and loss. She launched forward, about to break into a run. Her boot never touched the ground. It burst from the forest faster than favorite mind could even register. It took her in its great arms, barbs like sharpening, bolt tearing through her dress, sinking into her flesh. It carried her off into the mist before she could even scream. Moonlight. A town grown to use the mourning those they had lost. Sixty-five men destined to die in a pitch black hole deep underground. Their bodies dragged up from the earth just so they can be put right back in it again. As a falconer, I suppose I should be used to death. It's my tool and my trade. I deal it out so that others might escape its claws. The world we live in, it's not so hospitable, not so tamed as we like to think. These towns, just like Moonlight, they try to look like they uh, belong. These people, they think building a house is the same as making a home. They don't know whose home they have stolen until the colors come for them. I left the mourners to shovel the dirt over the dead they departed. I rode through the moonlight on streets of freshly churned mud. The buildings had all been cut and shone from the virgin forest that surrounded this town on all sides. This place was once lush, wet green as far as the eye could see. Gold has a habit of changing all of that. The Moonlight Hotel just ahead, its warm inward holding a promise of a bath, a hot metal, a reprise from the bone chilling mist. As I drew close, I thought about my mission here. About the disappearances that Captain George Moonlight spoke of his letter 
to the Order of the Falcon. About a mining accident that killed 65 men. If those two things weren't connected, then I'm not a falconer. Yes, coincidences exist. But they're far more rare than people tend to believe. The proprietor of the Moonlight Hotel, Mary Sunkler, greeted at the door. Her bright smile clashed mightily with the black dress she wore out of respect to the town's recent tragedy. Natalie. Welcome to the Moonlight Hotel, Miss Winter. That's you, Nika. Oh, call me Cassie. And you're, uh, Marion Sutcliffe, I'm guessing? Please, call me Sunlight. Most people here around, most people around here do. On account of your sunny disposition? Her smile grew just that a little bit wider. She sure did have plenty of teeth. Not something to be taken for granted in a back county mining town like this. The staff are drawing a bath for you right now, and dinner's in the bar in an hour. Friendly. My pleasure. Oh, and the wake will start about then, too. The wake? Most of the miners. The one lost in the accident were Irish, a few Scots. It's tradition for them to drink hard and toast those who have passed. So what you're saying is, if you want to get a sensible answers out of these people tonight, you should aim for between rounds three or five, right? My thoughts exactly. Mary Sunkliff lived up to her nickname. Well, she certainly brightened my day. One purifying bath and delicious meal later, I found myself with a print of local miners dark in my hand and a bar full of townsfolk into question. Most people don't know about the colors. And those that do tend to wish they didn't. But there's a lot of falconer can learn from the people who think they can tell you. What they think they've seen and heard. And most of all, what they really don't want to tell you. I spotted a captain over the bar. The wealthiest man in this namesake town of this. I'd need to be talking to him about this letter to the falconer soon enough. Yet, perhaps there were others I needed to talk to first. Investigations are colored by the wants and the needs of the people affected, and you can't paint a full picture in just one shade. I caught Sunlight's eye. And she fixed me with a blindly smile of hers. Another brew, Cassie? Nope, uh, some advice. Regarding? Who here has the sharpest eyes and the biggest mouth? <laughs> sharpest eyes? Rimiru Weka Jones. The biggest mouth that belonged to Biddy Goodwin. Cassie, pick one. Uh. L learn more about Biddy Goodwin. 
Biddy Goodwin? Biddy was one of the first miners to strike gold here, before the good captain arrived and gave it a name. She obviously doesn't like to show off her wealth. I'm not one to presume the business of others, but if she made much of anything out of those early days, she hides it well. Enough to afford a bottle of whiskey or two enough. Per day. Really? I own a pub, Miss Winter. I tend to notice things like that. Learn more about Weekend Jones. Uh, Weekend Jones? He's a gambler. A good one. Doesn't miss a trick at the table or anywhere else that I've noticed. Is he a local barrio in Nai Tau tribe? No, he doesn't talk much about it, but I gather he's from the North Island somewhere. Then he's a long way from home. Talk to Captain Moonlight first. Sharp eyes and big mouth will have to wait, I'm afraid. Best pay my respects to the man who's paying my bill. Looks like you have the time anyhow. Biddy seems to have poor Echo well and truly cornered at the moment. Wicked indeed. As I approached him, Captain Moonlight fixed me one cool smile I'd come to expect from a colonial businessman. A new country meant new rules, new ways of doing things. Everyone was finding their feet. Some succeeding, may not. It was a time to be cautious. A time to when the trust was hard to earn and find as gold. Jordan, try to do a Scottish accent you can. Good of you to come to our beleaguered little town, Miss Winter. You rode up from Fort Eden, did you? I did, yes. Not an easy journey, that. He came via the central Tago goldfields, then over Arthur's Pass. Word has it there are bushwalkers on that road now. Not as many as the newspapers would have you believe. And even a few less now. George nodded, clearly impressed. A woman traveling alone? I imagine that they taught you easy pickings. I suspect those pistols of yours persuaded them otherwise. Yes, they've been known to change the minds of less enlightened when needed. But, as you know, I'm not really in the people hunting business. Indeed not, as you must have gathered from my letter to your Order of the Falcon. I don't think people are at the heart of your problems here in the moonlight. He pointed at the tumbler of whiskey he'd placed in the bar. Care for a tipple to smooth our negotiations? Perhaps later, Captain. All right then. Down to business. Your letter. It mentioned some missing persons. Perhaps a dozen? This is a mining town. People tend to come and go without a buy your leave. But yes, as far as I can reckon, you have 15 unexplained disappearances. Miss Margaret Matthews being the latest. She went missing yesterday. Sounds like I got here none too soon. My thoughts exactly. George produced a contract from his jacket pocket, and we talked over finer details. Sounds the cause of the disappearances transpired to be human in origin. 
a sizable donation would be made to the Order of the Falcon in thanks of the reestablishing civil rest in the town of Moonlight. Should it come to light that the town's troubles be color in nature, then an even larger sum would be donated to the Order in return for hunting down and dispatching said colors. A pretty standard contract, really. I'd seen it uh, like many times before. And many a prior mission. Although, in all honesty, this was the first one I'd signed for myself. My first solo mission. Not something I divulged to Captain Moonlight. I thought it might uh, shake his confidence in me. Didn't wish to mention it again at all. Not even in my own head, in case it shook my own confidence. I sighted over Wicca and, and Biddy, just in time to, as their argument seemed about to be ready to boil over out something uglier. Kelly, if you will. Oh boy. Your Maggie goes into the bush, only you comes back. Mighty bloody suspicious if you ask me, Wicca. Very good. And chorus, duck. No one did ask you, Biddy. Maggie would if she was here. So, where is she? I don't know. Better at counting cards and corpses, eh, gambler? That's enough. Enough? How many folk you gotta vanish into the mist before it's really enough? Oh, me? Yes. Uh, politely distract Biddy. I figured it was time to intercede. Biddy Goodwin! B glared at me with a face like the one of his old potatoes left too long at the bottom of the sack. The eyes even matched. I don't think I'd ever seen those eyes so dark and full of spite. Who's asking? We can make the most of the distraction and beat the hasty retreat. To talk to him at some point, but I didn't think I'd get a straight answer out of Buddy while a gambler was still in the range of the antique of hers. See Winter. The one been tired to get to the bottom of these disappearances. Oh yeah? Who hired you? Captain Moonlight. <laughs> Biddy left out some and spotted into the carpet just shy of my boots. Then you're burning the cheating bastard's cash. The gobshite responsible just scampered out that door. Why do you think it's Wicca? Didn't nobody disappear until Wicca rode into town, all fancy on his black horse. Saw so him go into the bush with Maggie Matthews with my own eyes. She finished her statement with a healthy pull from a whiskey bottle. Sauce, red li li label. I'd heard of the stuff. Smooth as honey and hard as the coarse kick between the eyes. Brewed by some highland bootleggers in the deep south. How Biddy was getting a hold of the stuff was anybody's guess. When was that? Last night, just on sunset. Had you been drinking? 
no more than usual. Meg is uh, not seen since. That's right. Week is done for her, that's what. What about the others? They've gotten missing. Uh, you saw any of them go into the bush of the Wicca? I didn't think it was possible, but Biddy's face grew even more wrinkles as it puckered up in thoughts. Like another spit was brewing in the bitter with, with the answer. She turned up in that whiskey-soaked brain of hers. Mary? Oh my god, I was muted. I'm so sorry. Biddy Goodwin, you spit on my carpet again and I'll be spitting you out onto the street. Biddy glowed at the sunlight, but refrained from it. Ex Spectorating all the same. Nope, I've not seen anyone else go into the bush with Wika. Doesn't mean it hasn't happened, mind you. Judging by his attire, I doubt Wika ventured into the bush much at all. Would I be wrong there? Suppose not. Keep Biddy calm. You seem like one who keeps track of the comings and goings in this town, Miss Goodwin. Do I now? I think so. And perhaps you saw someone else head out the bush around the same time as Weaker and Maggie. Perhaps a little sooner? You think if I'd seen anyone else, I'd be pointing blue bloody murder at Wika? So you saw no one before or after? You know, before we continue, um, Doc, is this Wika or Weka? It's pronounced Weka. Oh, okay. Just checking. We Weka? Uh, so you saw no one before or after? Not a soul. Heard something, though. No, that's not right. I didn't hear something, that's what. It seemed Whiskey was finally taking its stall on Biddy's brain. Did you hear something or not? Keep your fancy blonde locks on, Falconer. I'm getting to it. Fact is, I didn't hear the birds that evening. No toy nor bellbird. No wood pigeons flapping about with that whooshing sound they make. Nothing. The New Zealand's bush is usually a riot of a bird's song in the evening, so that likely meant one thing. There'd been a caller about. Thank you, Miss Goodwin. And, if you don't mind, you and I should speak again soon. I ain't going nowhere. And don't call me Miss Goodwin. We're not in church, Falconer. Biddy will do fine. All right. While we're on the topic of names, I prefer Cassie. She gave me a weary smile and took a long pull from the bottle. She drank, her eyes switched from me to the bar and grew a shade darker. Out of the corner of my eye, caught the finely tailored jacket. Neatly trimmed, dark beard, black hair, and gleaming black boots. Seemed that Biddy had a bit of hate in with regards to Captain Moonlight. At that point, Biddy clearly decided it was time 
to parting shots and dramatic exit. She fixed Captain Moonlight with a sinister squint and pointed at him with a pudgy digit. Oi, King George, when are you planning to get off my land? My land, you sold it, fair and square. George's response was a chuckle of warm, well-practiced patience. Yeah, like the bullet I'm going to put square between those cheating eyes of yours. Careful now, Biddy. That sort of talk will earn your night in the goal. At least Biddy had been a good sense to shut her mouth from that point on. Instead, she muttered something about King George and some unseemly carnal acts not worth repeating. And she stalked towards the door. And good night to you, Biddy. Please don't try to leave town. The reason Mina tipped her bottle, a mocking version of a salute, she was gone. My apologies, Miss Winter. Biddy's not one of our more peace loving citizens. Can't say I have all that much time for peace myself. I can try and keep it, but never seem to want to stay. And such is the life of a falconer, I suppose. I'll drink to that. Since George was buying, I sank a few more pints before talking to myself off to bed. Mostly to ease the aches of the road, but a little to loosen the knot of fear in my belly. Talk to Biddy first. My business was with Mr. Biddy Goodman has, wasn't done yet. I found Biddy taking her first slug of a liquid breakfast from her whiskey bottle. It seemed Biddy was a believer in the hair of the dog cure for hangovers. Essentially, in order to prevent hangovers, just don't stop drinking. You shot Waker yet? Nope. And you're not going to either. Why is that? Apart from you getting hung for it. Yep, already thought of that. Doing neck exercises twice a day. All right, then how about innocent until proven guilty? Biddy crackled in her bottle. Ain't the way life works, not in my experience. That's why you spend your time picking fights, is it? Someone's got to keep the bastards of this world honest. I knew exactly who that comment was aimed at. It was the chance to find out more about this feud between Biddy and George. Then again, people were dying and most might die if I didn't find my curlers and fast. The mighty accident was looming large in this investigation. Ask about the mining mining accident. 
I'm going to ask you a few. I'm going to ask this straight, Betty. So, don't go getting all offended and trying to that rusty antique of yours. Ask me what, Falconer? Did you have anything to do with the accident? Betty's face took on a puckered look in a rotten apple of her mouth started working side to side like she was preparing a nice, juicy spit in my face. But then the moment passed, her face softened, and she simply took another sip of her whiskey. I lost a lot of friends in that blast. I know. I'm sorry. Not half as sorry as them. And it weren't no accident. No? Not with Jimmy Corbett in charge of those explosives. Didn't talk much to Jimmy. Too busy worrying about his dynamite, about gas pockets, about lighted matches in wrong places. Jimmy Worry, the others all called him. And with Jimmy Worry down that mine, nobody else need bother with it. Could Jimmy have been a mistake? Could I go a day without a drink? Took that as a no. Thank Biddy for her time and thought about Jimmy Worry as I went in search for a well-dressed weaker to ply with questions. When an accident that kills 65 men turns out not to be an accident. Nine times out of ten, there is a color behind it. The Falcon has spent a few hundred years working that one out. I found Wicked dicing for gold dust with a pair of Chinese miners. I watched them for a little while from across the street, focusing on those dice as they tumbled across the podge boards of the Flynn General Store. By the sixth roll, it became damn sure that those dice were loaded. Prove that wake us a cheat. Popped back into the Moonlight Hotel, borrowed a glass of water, and sauntered a real casual like over Weka and his prey. Then I intercepted those dice mid tumble and ignored the result the roughly com complaints as I dropped the dice into my glass. And sure enough, the boat settled onto the bottom, sixes down. Make eyes starting up at me. The miners looked at Wicca. Wicca looked back. I dropped my glass and drew my guns before anyone had the time to do anything stupid. At that point, Wicca proved himself to be a man of good sense, handing back the miners dust and some extra sterling as way of an apology. He even managed to an amused smile and miners stuffed off down the street, heading for the Moonlight Hotel to no doubt celebrate their narrow escape from misfortune. Begging your pardon, Miss Winter, but shouldn't you be out hunt hunting for lost folk rather than trying to despoil my good reputation? Just one Maggie Matthews? I don't know where she is. I didn't say that you did, Mr. Jones. Then what are you saying? I'm not. I'm asking. Why did the two of you part ways at Giggling Glade? The question caught him off guard, as intended. You make a habit of prying into the personal matters of innocent gentlemen? Yes. 
So was our the street as you would hope? Your little bush lies on, not go as planned? Quite the opposite. You can bear me the sticky details, just the facts, please. She threw herself at me, and I gracefully declined her affections. That sort of thing happened to you often, Mr. Jones. Please, call me Wiramu. Cassie. We shook hands and performed what the Maori called a hongi. A traditional pressing of noses in respectful greeting. Apparently, it's about sharing the breath of fire together. And I have to admit, I could see why the ladies fancied this Wormo Jones. Well presented, well mannered, and with eyes like rich dark chocolate. Yes, unfortunately so. And I make a point of never taking advantage. It's the way my mother raised me. My mother me to shoot any man that looked at me funny. Then we both had the counsel of wise women. Guess so. But let's hear the thought of Maggie's mother now, shall we? All right. Maggie took my rejection rather badly. Unrequited love. It's not an easy thing to bear. She threatened to take she threatened to tell the town that I'd uh, taken her by force. Oh. You can imagine how that would have gone. The word of a Maori man against that of a Pahika woman, the daughter of a respected carpenter. You'd be hanging from a tree by sunset. Exactly. I have to admit, though, Wermo, that's pretty good motive for murder. Most folks around here would agree with you. That's what, which is why I was in the process of hustling up some funds for a hasty departure from town. That is, until you rather elegantly foiled my hustle. So you'll just have to stay and prove your innocence then, Wermo. Is that your way of saying, if you try to leave town, I'll shoot you? You're a smart man. Explains why I'm still alive. With that, he strolled off down the street swinging his cane and whistling, just cheerful gentleman, taking his morning constitutional. Though the sun was weak in the gray sky, there was just enough warmth to have lifted the mist off the bush a little. It was time to venture onto the damp forest to discover the fate of Maggie Matthews for myself. I followed the narrow trail through the damp forest, the mist still concealing much that should have been the view in the time of the day. It made me wonder if the colors were having something to do with it. They could, behind their nature, wicked evil, even the weather some sometimes. So little mist was probably well within their capabilities. Had I known the job involved being constantly wet and clammy, I'm not sure I would have signed up to be the falconer in this first place. But I suppose it's a small sacrifice for having the world. 
Not that a lot of the world with all the worth saving, mind you. But the bits that were, they kind of made up for the rest. A couple of curious fantails danced in the air about me as I walked. I chatted back to them, doing my best impression of a cork rubbed against the neck of a bottle. Some would see a visitation from a fantail as a bad omen. But uh, from memory, is just when a fantail flies into your house. When it's come to say something, it's usually never good news. Someone's going to die before the night's done. Out in the bush, they're just saying hello. The sluggy trail broke out into the picturesque glade. Giggling glade currently empty of a flip locked lovers. I had no idea I'd been draw anything out of that place, but I had to try. If something had happened there, something tragic, something terrifying, something that could have left an imprint, I needed to see it. I positioned myself in the center of the glade, closed my eyes, reached out with mine, embraced myself to the bare witness as I'd been taught. There was Maggie Matthews, hands balled into fist, tears running down her cheeks, glowing as Wicca's back as he disappeared down the path. I saw her muster herself, dark thoughts twirling about her like optimum smoke, and draw one of her father's chisels from the folds of her dress. Chisel brandished, she started after weaker. Her first step trembling, the second one, the third, She didn't get to make the third. A shadow brought, burst from the forest and took Maggie mid-step, a blur of predation and monstrosity, a color. Maggie Matthews was gone before she could even scream. I opened my eyes, took some deep breaths, and waited until my heart slowed from the gallop to counter. Then I set off into the bush, starting to the point where Maggie and the collar had breathed the tree line. The collar had left nothing to betray its path. No physical sign of any tracker, no matter how skilled, could have followed. So I closed my eyes, committed my mind to an empty darkness, and listened to the dying echoes of Maggie's terror and pain. I followed that story trail all day until the sun lurked low overs of the damp, Hills. The shadow were long in the day, nearly done when I saw the first physical sign that I was in color territory. A miner's boot had submerged in the mud, rotted leaves disturbed by body dragged, a severed finger still bearing its wedding ring. I drew my guns and crept through the bush, taking each step with a silent, painstaking care. 
As I moved, I scanned my surroundings, searching for the barest moment of of fan leaf or bond. A flash of color that didn't belong, a whisper of air displaced anything that might signal imminent attack. The forest remained as quiet and sombre as script. The birds had long since fled. At last, I saw a break in the trees ahead, a clearing filled with the evening sunlight. I paused to wipe the nervous sweat from the handles of my pistol, blew softly off my pants to fry them. If I dropped one of my guns, it's the last mistake I'd ever make. Then I pressed on, sneaking, watching until the last reached the edge of the clearing. There, I hung down behind a decaying pile of, of plunge and took the scene of, a, of this serene, subnatural collar before me. Maggie Matthews had the complexion of a tuna cheese, chalky, white and pale, exhaust, extinguished blue. Rigor launched and had terrifying and screamed upon her face, and her eyes were a bottled egg left to grow cold and forgotten in their cups. Yet she moved. A slot, a slow mentioned jerk of the colors mandals would chew through the tor torso. Slowly and surely, I, I drew a bead of one of my colors glistering compound eyes. A 45 caliber slung the pure gold shot through the eyes and into the brain. One shot kill. At least that's how it played out in my imaginations just before I pulled the trigger. But the color had other intentions. Whether it heard the outtake of my breath of the of the slightest creak from the trigger mechanism, the thing somehow knew my bullet was coming for it. I trashed the head downwards, meeting the slug with a, with a heavy chin and abandoned by the monstrous skull. Exoskeleton and pitch black blood showered the trees beyond. But the injury had nothing slowing the color down. Both guns gazing, I dove clear of the colon's cruelty, terrain the arms plunged into the plunge of the tore apart. I rolled to my feet and came about and barely managed to put some solid removed between myself and the color before those chitinous teeth had the lashing once more. In this case, barely turned out to be not quite enough. One of the brutal arms found nothing but air. tip of the other taking the coat, shirt, and flesh of my right side right before burying itself in a teeth trunk. <laughs> While the collar thrashed and hissed, trying to wrench its arm tree, I gave my teeth against the searing pain of the side, raised the colts, and put my two remaining slugs through its monster's eyes. The 
like the lovers of the giggling glade, those bullets kissed in a seclusion and they then went into the separate ways. The cold skull, already weakened by my maiden shock, dis disintegrated. Its massive body is thrashed a few moments, decapitated confusion, and then slumped simply into the print earth. A moment of victory had shot one as the bleeding flesh reminded me of the cost. No shame in crying, and I did, and I did just that. It took the bottle of the Parlin's remedy from the coat pocket, unstopped it with the trembling hands, and done its contents. Like most of the falconer alchemists, Bruce, it simmered with welcome warmth of the way down, and it burned like a bitch as it got to the work got to work I eased myself to the ground put my back against the tree and tried not to scream of the agony of the Farland's remedy knitting my inside back together after what seemed like an hour but it was probably only a few minutes the pain subsided to the point where I could once again think and see with some clarity. As the remedy finished its work, I took in the clearing and its macabre inventory. It looked like the most the moonlight disappearances would end up being explained by the by this one blood soaked dell of the shattered bone, tattered cloth tattered cloth and shredded flesh. It was impossible to tell exactly how many people had shared Maggie's fate, but a quick skull count told me a dozen at least. And just when I'd finished counting, that's when I saw the eggs. I straddled to my feet and crossed the clearing and stepped the best I could around the remains of the tragically departed. The first egg looked like it belonged to the colors I just slain. A long, waxy cochrane, some ten feet in length, raptured from the inside out. Its twin lay nearby. Same length, same burst, open appearance. I brought one of the monsters down, but there was another out there. Equally big, equally ferocious, and now wise to the fact that there was a falconer on its trail. Then I saw a third cocoon, obscured by a fern of the edge of the clearing. Despite the cool, clammy air, the sweat dreaded on my skin as I looked over. To the thing it took its grotesque beauty. It was smoother, more delicate than its cousins, like a baby a baby coat made of pure silk. The top had been neatly slid open and its contents disgorged without the slightest disturbance to its smooth lines. And what sort of content? Centipedes, a thousand or more. A curling, wriggling mass of legs, mandibles, and glistening snuffle chitin. A thousand mere 
mere mindset, mere, mere mindless creatures that that when joined forge the single and and fiendishly clever intelligence. A cedar. I look from one cocoon to the next, and to the next. This wasn't a color problem. This was a bloody infestation. I felt the tears sting my eyes once more. They weren't tears of pain this time. Farland's cocoon had seen to that. No, they were the tears of frustration and something else.